Well, this is a, a special day uh, because this is the uh, ninth anniversary of Lung Po Cha's death. So in Thailand, Wat Pa Pong, they're having a, a, a kind of a memorial day for uh, Lung Po Cha. They meet for a week before and it kind of reaches its ultimate on this day, the 16th of January. <clears throat> So reflecting on this, this death and uh, Lung Pa Cha, these are all perceptions of the mind, aren't they? They're, they're memories. And then we can use those memories for skillful means, or we can dismiss them, or we can hold them just out of in a, a usually worldly way of worldly attitudes. Somebody died nine years ago, named Lumpur Cha. <clears throat> and not many of you, some of you knew him personally, some meant most of you didn't. In terms of reflecting on the way it is, this, uh, this, uh, sanya, memory, ability to, we have, we have a, this re- retentive memory, so we can, uh, have memorial days and reflect upon, uh, or celebrate the the goodness of wisdom of our teacher, which is using it in a skillful way. But then ultimately, it's uh, what Lung Po Cha was pointing to was was beyond uh, just a celebration of him as some kind of great teacher towards the uh, stillness of the mind. So then one is, you know, to me this is the true, you know, the true way of uh, expressing gratitude and appreciation is by actually putting into practice uh, what he was consistently, constantly pointing to rather than reminiscing uh, about the, the person himself. So when when we uh, when we had the Ajahn Chah weekend in last April in uh, California, it was kind of a celebration, and of course we we reminisced about the anecdotes and experiences of various monks, nuns, and lay people who had encountered him in some way, either through personally or through reading his book. And of course, this this is a way of inspiring the mind. You know, when when somebody dies, as a great person dies, like Lung Po Cha, then they have this apotheosis. They suddenly uh, get placed up among the stars, and uh, then they're, they're no longer human anymore. Like it's happened to Ajahn Man and and all these, these great teachers. <clears throat> so that those that come afterwards, they, they kind of hear the, the inspired stories. And they, they can look up to the stars, the stars that are distant, far away, pristine, bright and pure and inspiring. So 
And so then we we can get very uh, we can inspire the mind that way. That's one way of that's necessary at first to have is a kind of n- initial inspiration, which is a kind of high uh, you get through through thinking about how wonderful, how perfect, how beautiful, how wise somebody else is. But then inspiration reaches its peak and then you can't sustain it. You, you, you know, you got people that depend on inspiration usually... <coughs> have to go around looking for a new one, somebody new to inspire them to some new cause or belief. So in the religious life, in any religion, isn't it, those practitioners, usually we start out with inspiration, and after a while that wears out, and then we become, becomes more like desperation. We like the the convention we're in that inspired us in the beginning, we only see in terms of what we don't like about it, what's wrong with it. <clears throat> the flaws, the warts, the 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 faults that we become very aware of when we're no longer inspired by it. And living with it teacher like Lung Po Cha is very, very, I'm very grateful for that opportunity because uh, you know I was actually living with a living, breathing human being rather than a, a, a kind of star up in the sky and so you, you realize the humanity uh, that we all share in the the earthiness and the groundedness and the practicality and even the, the faults and the irritating habits because when you're living with an actual human being it's uh, then we we endlessly irritate each other no matter how saintly and <clears throat> good and how refined we try to be with this this natural state of irritation that takes place on on this earth plane. With having a, a great teacher, a very famous, a wise teacher, also it's easy to to be intimidated by them, so that you always one's always quoting the like Numpa Cha said, and and uh, or we're quoting the Buddha, or Numpa Cha, or Ajahn Mahabua, or Numpu Man, Buddha Tat, and on and on like that. Because uh, maybe they're very wise sayings that we connect with, that we appreciate. So these are, this is, this is a, the, the worldly mind still operating where we grasp the sayings, the words, the teachings, the doctrines, the principles, the inspiration from Outside ourselves, we look up into the sky at the stars. We apotheosize various ajans who've died. You can't do it very well while they're still alive. But when they're dead, then it's easy to do. 
and biographies of Lung Po Cha that I've read so far, they're, they're all, you know, about, you know, Jack Cornfield's approach is very much the, the great master says, and every time anything happens, Lung Po Cha arises to the occasion and says something incredibly profound. And, and so this is the, this is the, <laughs> This is the impression you get from a book and somebody who, who is presenting the, you know, wants to inspire using the medium of literature to inspire. No, I'm just reflecting out loud, not trying to convince you of anything. But, but how to use uh, memory for Dhamma practice. Because the uh, ability to remember, have memory, is, is a gift, but it also can be a curse in the way we can be obsessed get obsessed with memories of the past, with ideas, uh, obsessive thoughts and that that keep appearing in our consciousness. With Lung Po Cha, of course, to me that's a pleasant memory. I, I don't it's hard for me to remember that actual times that I didn't like him, that I hated him, that I found him really irritating, and so forth. I, I don't remember those. I remember having such periods, but uh, that's not what comes up in my mind when I think of Lung Po Cha at this moment. <clears throat> Uh, when I reflect on that perception of Lung Po Cha, there's always a lot of gratitude, sense of katanyu, uh, gatawaiti, this gratitude for uh, all the uh, kind of acceptance and uh, accepting me and teaching and helping and encouraging me in every way. <coughs> And then I look back at the early years, uh, the, uh, my total frustration of, of uh, my early monastic life, just like just stumbling around endlessly, not knowing really what I was doing half the time, because I was uh, just in a you know whole situation that was totally new and different culturally different, linguistically, in every way different than what I had ever been used to. <clears throat> but then the, the teaching was always a direct pointing. He had this great ability to, to hit the mark. So... It, and people oftentimes ask me, how could you, how could you learn from him since you didn't have a common language at the first year? Uh, how could he teach you anything? If he, if he couldn't speak English, you couldn't speak Thai. And this, uh, this, because we think we learn through, through language, that, uh, kind of formal talks and, Discussions and reflections through thought, and, and that is the 
is the kind of what teaching is really about. But basically, through the first couple of years, uh, I learned more through just uh, being aware. You know, I got the point quite easily, quite quickly, that practice was awareness. So I, um, my confusion, my uh, paranoia, and um, negative feelings and attitudes and reactions I could I could reflect on. So even though I wasn't uh, you know particularly the the um, getting a, a lot of you know profound teaching on the even though he was certainly giving profound teachings but I couldn't understand them usually, so um, but I picked up on the on the other level, on the intuitive plane. He was always one. He didn't really encourage us to study a lot, to get a lot of knowledge. Just a kind of basic knowledge, what they use in the monastic system in Thailand, which is called naktam, or kind of basic dhamma knowledge that monks in Thailand are expected to acquire. And that, that was really, and I had that kind of knowledge. <clears throat> and then the, uh, and then his whole emphasis was on the practice. So he advised me not to read anything the first year. Just to, he said, put all your books under, away and don't look at them. And just, if you want to read anything, read your own mind. If you want to watch a show, watch what goes on in your consciousness. I remember feeling some, you know, bring up a lot of immature feelings in me when you're frustrated and uh, feel out of it. Like you, when everybody's laughing, having a good time, you just, I'm just sitting there feeling angry and, and uh, misunderstanding a lot, reading things in the wrong way, taking things in the wrong way, bring up all these kind of childish reactions, like wanting to run away or or uh, rebel against it, or I could get very feel very rebellious and and very uh, arrogant, like uh, or put it all down, dismiss everything as ridiculous. Um, get caught up in these these habits that that you develop when you're a child. Even throwing kind of temper tantrums. Feeling very stubborn sometimes, resistant, stubborn. And yet, uh, I found that I could reflect on this. I just, uh, in some of the, my books, I relate to these incidences where where my arrogance, my stubbornness and rebelliousness, I began to see through it, you know, how, how much suffering I was creating, that I was the, you know, I was really the creator of my own suffering. And so, this, uh, this approach I found very, very helpful because, uh, I'd been through the, all the realms of inspiration uh, many times over. 
And by the time I arrived at the Wat Papo, I was uh, pretty disillusioned with life in general and with myself. So I knew I, I didn't need to go and look for some, you know, when I was fed up with life at Wat Pong or become disillusioned or critical of it. I had this intuition that I there was no point in going anywhere, running away from it, but to resolve it. And and so this was the message I was always getting from Lung Po Cha. Sometimes he'd say to me, he'd look at me and he'd see me looking really down and miserable and he'd say, oh, poor tomato. <laughs> and suddenly I could see what I was doing, you know, how I was caught in, a, in my own mood. I believed my own mood. I was lost in my own feelings. <clears throat> Well, you say, oh, Sumedho, he likes to suffer. You <laughs> 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 say this with other monks around, too. <laughs> but it's true, these kind of even that alone it would have snapped me out of it. I mean, I just could just see what I was doing. You know, I could, once I caught it, it's so easy to slip back into these emotional habits. You know, and, get, and kind of get, they're so strong. And it's so easy to just fall back into them. And that's where I found the monastic form very helpful because it, it provided a kind of vehicle or an order to my life which could I could use to uh, to snap out of things, to rise up to situations. Uh, I had to rise up to be better than I usually felt like being and just learning to to use the 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 form, the structure, the discipline, the style, in a way that uh, would help me, would be a, remind me, bring me back to the present. So our life here at Amravati is, you know, if we're using it skillfully, then this is, I encourage this, of using it for remembering, for this awareness, rather than endlessly just try to just go along with it, thinking that blind conformity is the way, or thinking that, uh, you know, always feeling there's something wrong with it, there's something you've got to change or you don't like about it, dwelling on its weaknesses or its faults or flaws. It's like, you know, it's a, it is the way it is, this form. Theravada Buddhism is like this. And so it's, it's, it's still a convention. And a convention has no soul or no heart to it. It's merely an empty form, a condition. So then reflecting on it like this, uh, I began to see that that one had to put the, the spirit into the form, which is the spirit here. 
in Sumato, putting that spirit into the form rather than expecting the form to inspire me. And then when it no longer inspired me to just put it down and uh, or criticize it or feel disillusioned with it. So this practice of mindfulness is where you, you know, the spirit is here and now, using this word spirit. It's this awareness, this awakened state of the spirit. If we trust in the spirit, then the forms come to life. They have a beauty of their own when they're, when they're not just empty kind of corpses or dreary old traditions. So that's what I found in the Thailand with Lung Phra Cha, like so much of the Buddhism in Thailand that I saw before, I found quite depressing. It didn't inspire me like that, many of the temples and that. So, but when I met Lung Po Cha, I felt you know, that it inspired me because he's actually, he'd put his spirit into the form of the forest monk. So the, the forest monk, the spirit of that life, suddenly it was alive. It wasn't just a dreary kind of conforming to a bunch of rules and traditions and and kind of binding yourself to some kind of thing that was created 2,500 years ago. So then this puts, uh, puts me, would allow me to say that, that this kind of freedom, you know, that that one has even in the midst of restriction and restraint and of vinaya, the freedom is is in the spirit of it all, rather than through the like physical freedom or whatever to just do what you want to say what you feel like saying. I think it's a good reflection to see, reflect on it, conventions or forms, sankaras of any kind. They're dead, all of them. You know, they have nothing to them. They, they, they arise and cease and they, and the, but how we use them, that's what, what, when we say we're alive, when we're we have a spirit when we're fully present, when we're fully engaged in the present. And that's giving full strength to the spirit of life. We're using forms for our expression then, rather than trying to identify with the forms endlessly, trying to live up to ideals. And that's what, say, my cultural conditioning tended to be, was always trying to live up to ideals. And we can create ideals of perfection, of how everything should be and how I should be. <clears throat> but ideals are dead also. They're just empty forms. When you, when you look at them through intuitive awareness, isn't it? Absolute goodness is uh, not much left to it, is it? It's a, you can you can put it into the, the best. The best is better than the best. Absolutely ultimate, tip top, and as high as you can get with the language. It 
it all fizzles out in the end. Like all these titles and and that then people <laughs> take on. I remember Dar Frijan when I was in America last year as claiming some new title that was so high that it was higher than God, Buddha or anything. <laughs> I find that very amusing. <laughs> Couldn't couldn't possibly create a title higher than that one. And uh, <laughs> and that, that's how that's but that's the limitation of language, isn't it? It it uh, doesn't uh, you know it, it can only go so far. You have to relinquish thought analysis. reason and logic towards this intuitive sense. So that's why it's, it's, uh, language is, is linear. It's dualistic. And you have good and you have bad, right and wrong, male, female. And so then you, you're stuck on that level of just one thing opposing another. Usually we we see it as an op- opposition. But in like Taoism, the yin yang thing sees the opposites as complementary. But my cultural condition was was more on the linear side, seeing that it's one thing opposed to another, good against evil. These are ideas, aren't they? Good and evil. God is an idea. Buddha is an idea. It's a word. It's things. Are, it's a sound you make with your voice. <clears throat> you can print it out in Latin alphabet and or Thai alphabet, and it would still really nothing. Until you put the spirit into it. So it's taking that word and then reflecting on what is, what really is Buddha now. And that, if you try to figure it out, you can't. That's where you've got to trust in this, this reflective ability, this, this kind of stopping the thinking mind opening, contemplating at this moment. What what is Buddha at this present moment here and now? Or you can even do it with the word God. You know, that has so many emotional ramifications for most of us. Then it's a, a kind of fraught word, <clears throat> but it is another, just another word, isn't it? Allah, or whatever, it is, whatever <clears throat> religious view you have, is Buddha. A, and people want to want to say Buddhists believe in Buddha. They don't believe in God. Then Buddha is a god, and they try to figure it out that way. We want to have it all kind of rationally uh, aligned. And then we feel comfortable if we can figure it all out. But with intuitive awareness, one of the necessities, one of the things we really learn, profoundly learn, is how to live with not knowing, with discomfort and uncertainty, with allowing things to be unknown, uncertain, to be able to trust in the awareness to allow the dark, the mysterious, the unknown, the wonderful, the mystery to be, rather than endlessly try to figure it all out.
So that spirit then is, is a, I say, is this awareness. We can't, when we awaken, there's spirit in the present. When we're caught in our moods and doubts and worries and obsessions and memories, then we're actually dead. We're kind of just reliving old, worn out things, patterns, behavioral patterns. So you notice old people, you know, the way, you know, how they've lived their lives and if they have not awakened to life, their spirit has been squashed by life and they just tend to think the same things over and over. Or just spend the time till death just kind of distracting the mind with various objects. Really observe, you know, like Lung Po Cha said, old people are just pointing to, they teach us about old age. <clears throat> and so this is no matter any old person's teaching us about old age because it is, because this is what happens we're all getting old and so it's not not to to see old age in, in anymore in a kind of worldly sense as some kind of curse and thing to be feared but to see it as a fulfillment of what has been born. Then if we awaken the spirit within us, then then the aging process is no longer taken in the in the worldly sense. And as you get older then it'll bring up all your fears and views and problems around aging. Your van- youthful vanity and so forth, the identity with with youth, youth and vigor, attractiveness. Yesterday, uh, uh, yesterday morning. Uh, John Stevens phone and told me uh, Lord Young died the previous night at 86. And then a few minutes later, Ajahn Panyasayo came in with a letter from World Fellowship of Buddhists uh, telling me that uh, uh, Sanya Tamasak died in Thailand on the 6th of January. <coughs> and Ajahn Sanya was a, one of the great Thai uh, lay people who, who had held many important positions in his lifetime. Had been pri- was appointed prime minister by the king for several years and been president of the World Fellowship of Buddhists. He was a very kind of moral, very highly principled man. And uh, he never liked to go into politics. The king had to kind of compel him to take on that duty. Prime Minister, it was the last thing he wanted to do, and he got out as soon as he could. Because politics is not, you know, it's a pretty hard place to, to sustain the personal integrity for very long. He was 95, and I saw him last December. I'd, I'd go visit him. Uh, he was, he'd been, was bedridden for the last few years of his life. But when I saw him last December, he was, he was not very receptive to anything. He was definitely on his way out. But just reflecting on these two old 
kind of grand old men at the news of their death on the 15th and then the Lung Po Cha's death day on the 16th. So the, the subject of death seemed to be very dominant in my consciousness. The 19th, Friday, will be my mother's 100th birthday, if she were alive. <laughs> and so I think back, memory, I wasn't a, you know, I, my perceptions of a hundred years ago, in, she was born in uh, Yakima, Washington, Washington State, the Northwest. And Yakima is a, is a, it's quite a big city now, but it is a provincial town, kind of a, in the wild west. She was born on a ranch. And, uh, my grandfather was a rancher and was a cowboy, a rancher. <laughs> Now it's all so changing, <laughs> wouldn't uh, uh, it's hard to imagine. It seems like ancient history. But a hundred years is not, not all that long a time. So then the, the perception of death, isn't it? Death, old age, sickness. This past week I've had every opportunity to contemplate sickness. And uh, last Sunday I think it was at its apex of misery. And uh, it was... Uh, absolutely miserable day physically in terms of uh, physical experience and then of course the just the uh, discomfort and in, in uh, inconvenience and the depressing side of illness brings up negative thoughts negative emotions so just observing this, you know, really reflecting on the way it is that when the body is like this and you've got a cold, you've got the flu and you, your uh, chest is filled with yucky mucus and, you're, and you, whatever position you take is still uncomfortable. It was really cold all the time. It felt like, like there was this draft. It was cold draft coming in and on the floor and coming through my feet and coming up through the body like death was taking me over. And yet the, my cootie has underfloor heating. I couldn't figure that out. It's a draft proof cootie. And so they, they just, you know, this was a way of medit- contemplating the way it is. The, just the, the depressing, unpleasant, uncomfortable aggravation of a human body when it's sick. And the mental states that come from that, you know, because they connect. But then the the aim was to be awake to that rather than to 
to uh, ignore it or to believe in it and get wallow in it. So that's where I would practice with that, or, you know, just this, this, this uh, develop, this trust that I put in this stillness, the silence. Keep referring back to that, not letting the mind wander away in, the, in its, uh, negative, its, its movement toward negativity. So one can see that all these, these, uh, are opportunities. You know, like the Deva Dutas, the old age, sickness, death, <clears throat> heavenly messengers, rather than inconveniences and curses that sometimes they seem to be on the worldly level. You know, I don't like being sick at all. I find it uh, really inconvenient. And the last thing I wanted uh, to get for this retreat was to get sick. And uh, so the kind of kind of feelings of frustration and uh, restlessness bring up any kind of negative anything that bothering me or any kind of negative potential was certainly could be brought into full flow if if I would if I just uh, you know go along with it but in the stillness then it's like one isn't suppressing one's not denying suppressing but but allowing the movement of conditions So staying in the still point, learning to sustain and this, this sense of pure presence, which doesn't cancel out the movement of the conditioned realm, but embraces it. That's what I'm pointing to. Sometimes we don't know the difference between Accepting, like in, in stillness, accepting things, or um, we, I used to get confused. I thought I was repressing. If I didn't kind of totally go along, if some negative state came to my, you know, came up in consciousness, and then I had to figure out why, what should I do about it? Why do I feel like this? What's wrong? And I endlessly <coughs> analyze and figure it out on that level. I felt I was, you know, that's what I should be doing. Kind of face up to your faults, Sumato. You know, don't kind of back away and suppress or run away or resist like you usually do. You got to face up to these flaws, these faults, these weaknesses. Admit them, you know, go ahead, be brave. Face up to it. And this is a kind of jackal that, uh, I'm easily intimidated by. <laughs> And so then, uh, then the, uh, but not only had the, the, uh, negative feeling, but also the, the kind of preachy jackal, the one that was always, you know, nagging and telling me, you know, and saying, you've got to be brave and face up to it and face the music. But then trusting in the stillness of the mind and it, that whole scenario could be embraced rather than be perpetuated. And that's, that's an act of trust, isn't it? To, to allow those things to be, because it gets very confusing, but allowing that confusion or whatever is present now, allowing it to be what it is uh, as a feeling or as an energy, as a mood, 
And in that way, you're not, you're not uh, depressing and you're not indulging in it. Neither indulging or suppressing. So the old age, sickness, death, and the samana, the four devadutas, heavenly messengers. So learn from them, you know. He, you know we're, we're actually taking on the form of one of the messengers. I'm, I'm old, and I'm sick, and I'm a monk. <laughs> Three going at one time. <laughs> so then the samana is the, to me, that, that form, that image, the shaven head, the ochre robe, and so forth, is the image of awakeness. And that's that's what it like. Look at the Buddha Rupa and <clears throat> the particular form, style of Buddha images or of Buddhist monks, nuns. And the, the samana is awake, the, a human being who is awake. Uh, and in that awakened state, then one is no longer subject or bound into the limitations of personality or emotion or memory or the body. These still operate accordingly, but there's a transcendence. The true Dhamma or the deathless is realized through awakening. Awakening. So, the four Devaduta is the, is, uh, Buddha's pointing to the, what most people don't want to notice in, say, worldly life, isn't it? Old age, sickness, death. These we don't like, we don't want, but we all have to experience them. And so it's, uh, there's so much poetry, so much uh, you know, around the, the loss of the love as the old, as the beautiful woman ages and loses her beauty and, and the uh, grand warrior, the great man, strong and confident, loses it all and becoming a kind of old, wizened, shriveled up old thing and then death. I remember, I remember him when he was at his peak. He was a grand, noble warrior. She was a wonderful, beautiful woman. Now she's just a wrinkled old hag. <laughs> and we think, uh, you know, the sadness of that image of, of a wo- beautiful woman that loses the beauty through aging. And disease, and then death, or the, the the noble male, the man, has the same goes through the same process. So these are, you know, why did the Buddha point particularly point to these four devadutas? There's too many 
people of other religions is rather depressing to think about. But it's it's not really because it's part of it's uh, our, what we all are experiencing. <clears throat> it's about the way things are. And then the samana is the is the point where we we awaken to the deathless. The deathless and the awake and awakening are the same thing. The more you trust in in awakenness, you're already there, the deathless. As soon as you get get thrown back into the I'm getting old and I'm sick and I don't know, life is so disappointing and I'm not like that, then then you're back into the realm of death. You become an old man or an old woman. And you become sick and weak and pathetic and tragic and all that. And then you become a corpse. And then, we, you know, we don't like to look at corpses. And as soon as somebody dies, you whisk them away. Uh, so you don't have to look at them. The idea, like, of, of keeping a corpse I thought it would be, like here in England, if we, somebody dies, or if I die, you can put me out in the field, you know, just watch me deteriorate. To most people, that would be sick, be disgusting. We'd be condemned by the society, wouldn't we? Because uh, I think that's a uh, really weird, evil sect that kind of enjoy. And they get their, they get high off watching their teacher decay. (laughs) But to me, that would be a good teaching. (laughs) It would uh, be very good for you, too. Because of that is uh, decay is ugly and smelly, isn't it? And we don't like ug- ugly things or stenches. And you know, there's this this longing for for paradise and heaven and beauty and and so the, we're lost in this in this realm of ideals of how. We could live forever in a paradise of perpetual beauty and joy. And then that's a, that's an ideal that we can create with our mind. But in reflecting on the Dhamma, the emphasis on the way it is, and the way it is is like this, old age, sickness, death, a, a part, important part of I mean, we're all, well, you're still young, you, you have, you, you know, you can see it as a long way off. But I was, I was young yesterday. <laughs> Seems like only yesterday. So don't, don't think that because you're young, you've got all that much time to put it off. It, Recognize that this is uh, that all this in our society, the way that the society is now, with all its sicknesses and its endless problems and and uh, mental stress, and it, it, these are all devadutas for us living in this society, and that they're they're teaching us about the way things are. That the material world, the the conditioned realm, is like this. You know, it just, you know, it, it goes on and on, no matter how refined and good and beautiful you try to make it. It always has its other side to it. So that we've you know, in the Western world, we've tried so hard to create these earthly paradises where, you know, everything's, you know, well, pretty and high quality, efficient, fair, just. 
in spite of all the best attempts, there's, there's so many things wrong with it. So many worms, so many snakes, so many ugly things that happen in the best of societies. <clears throat> Why is that? What's wrong? What's wrong with, with the UK that it has all these problems? We try to figure out, we've got to keep trying to find out what's wrong and try to make them, make them right. And so the emphasis is always on running around trying to change everything, make it better and better, right the wrongs. Whereas someone does, we're at a very privileged position of getting to the source of it, isn't it? The, the condition realm is like this. That birth is the cause of death. So being born it means that you're, you're going to die. Being born is the cause of old age and sickness. And if we weren't born, we wouldn't get sick, we wouldn't get old. <coughs> So being born in a human, human being, then we, we're subject to these conditions, to, to pain and to violence, to abuse, all the war, uh, all these things that, that human beings are so, so, uh, obsessed with. You know, these are, this is, this is the realm we're living in, a realm where it's a very painful realm, actually, when you contemplate it. But when you contemplate it in terms of Dhamma, then you're not, you're, you're not complaining about it or blaming on any, anyone. But you can then embrace it in this world that we live in. So that one's own lifespan is is the occasion for for understanding and to realize your true nature the deathless so as a as a human being then you we have this this opportunity to to know both the death realm and the deathless Then I see there's the still point, the silence. And as I rest in that silence and trust in it, then, then the conditioned realm, I allow the conditioned realm to be what it is. No longer am I kind of judging it or getting caught up or trying to fight against it or condemn it. So in terms of the fourth day with Dutta, the Samana, then this is the, it's the, that's the real teacher, isn't it? The awakenness. You as a, the kind of individual being that you are, and that, but that awakenness is the is the gate to the deathless. And therefore, you embrace the way you are. You know, you can be fully the way you are. You can really. Uh, you know, accept even the, the, the good and the bad side. All belong. And you learn. You, you understand through embracing rather than through resisting. So this is, this is for you to find out what is the difference. There's one, you know, how to embrace without attaching.
and is letting go or non-attachment is that repression or resistance these are you know the subtleties of that you have to know for yourself through your own uh, experiments and willingness to to use the the way you are for developing the path So this is a reflection and dedicated to uh, memory of Lumpur Cha and uh, offer this uh, to encourage you today.